Details on the Cliff Rosenberger probe and more fallout from the Urban Meyer suspension. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Laura Bischoff, State House reporter for the Dayton Daily News. Kathy Kandiski, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Gene Krebs, former state legislator, and Joseph Moss of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. We knew the FBI was investigating former House Speaker Cliff Rosenberger. That's why he abruptly quit. Reports were the feds were looking into his ties to the payday loan industry. This week, the suspicions were confirmed Court documents released this week show investigators are looking for evidence of extortion, conspiracy to commit extortion, and bribery under the Federal Travel Act. Lord Bischoff, you've been a lead reporter in this investigation from the get-go. We have not seen any, there's no, this is evidence they are looking for. We don't know they have found any evidence of this, correct? That's right. So Cliff Rosenberger's attorney, David Axelrod, said in a statement that, you know, a search warrant is really like a wish list of, you know, dear Santa, this is what I'd like for Christmas. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything that they ask for is going to, you know, be material to what they're, what they think is there. Um, and also, you know, a search warrant is not an indictment and an indictment is not a conviction. So I think it's still pretty early in this uh, process. But to see those words in black and white, that this is what the investigation involves. Sure, and it identified starving. the targets as Cliff Rosenberger and then three representatives of the payday lending industry, uh, two lobbyists, Steve Diamond of Columbus and Leslie Gaines of South Carolina, mm -hmm. and then Carol Stewart, who is a um, executive with Advance America, which is a payday lending company. Is it unusual, Joe, for these documents to be out there in, during a, in a federal investigation? Well, actually, what I found surprising, and I did uh, take a, a look at the at the search warrant, is how specific it was. And it's almost as if they had already the information that they were looking for. That's what I found a little bit surprising. At least in my experience, when I see search warrants, they're a little bit more general than that. But then it could be because the story had been out there and they had enough information to go on. Although I think that the the search warrant, was this, the subpoena, was issued um, only a couple days after Dayton Daily broke the story on April 6th. And so we kind of wonder if they were already... I, I was going to say, actually, that I think they probably use your story uh, as uh, great uh, assistance <laughs> in doing that. <laughs> uh, so... He, Rosenberger denies these allegations. Kathy, the attorney, says right. there's nothing new here. We knew he was under investigation, and he did nothing wrong. They're kind of downplaying the whole thing and, and also emphasizing that he is cooperating fully with investigators, so we'll see where it goes. One of the more interesting aspects of all this paperwork that was revealed was the inventory of the things that were taken from Rosenberger's office. Of course, a lot of records, a lot of papers, some flash drives with documents, no big surprise, but there was a lot of memorabilia and this painting. Andy Thomas paints the GOP president's playing cards sitting around a table. Abe Lincoln apparently has told a joke that Dwight Eisenhower finds very amusing. And in the corner there, you see it in the, in the right corner, Cliff Rosenberger. There with all the GOP presidents, past, present, gone forever. He was not in the original painting, Laura, correct? This, is, this was added in and it was hanging in... In his the office. speaker's office lobby. Right. It, it appeared in the 53-page inventory of all the all the stuff. It's unclear who um, got that for him or who paid for it. Uh, Jackie Borchard of Cleveland.com uh, traced it down to some artist in the Dayton Mall. Who, Andy Thomas. Well, well the, 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 the original, original artist is Andy Thomas, Andy yes. Thomas and he has copyright yeah. um, rights to the to that painting and does not allow you know adaptations mm -hmm. like that. Yep. But the, the adaptation was done by somebody I think who operates out of the Dayton Mall. Gene, what do you think of that painting? Um, I am appalled. Um, I, if that was, I hope it was given to him as a joke. If it was as a joke, it should have remained in his own bathroom at home, hanging up. Um, but the fact it was hanging up in the speaker's office, and I just go to, I mean, I can, yeah, it's early. Like you said, we have no idea if any of the allegations are true or anything, but compared to the um, graft and corruption under Dick Celeste and Vern Reif. I'm struck by the banality. I mean, we're talking here um, um, these little bobblehead dolls and everything. You know, um, uh, it, it just struck me as being kind of odd about all this. But I will tell you that I believe that um, somebody who, a Republican, decided to go ahead and 
do, drop the dime on this in a way to go ahead and discredit the Rosenberger administration because of the uh, battles going on inside the caucus. Now, Gene, I object to you citing only Democrats with respect to alleged corruption. Right. I think there's enough of that to go around. <laughs> Uh, where does it go to? Where does this investigation go next, Laura? Do we have any idea where they are? We've I think it's kind of to be determined. Yeah. Um, it's not like the feds are going to be chatty Cathy's about, you know, this is where we're going, and they don't, they don't telegraph that ahead of time. All right. Our next topic, there has been a story unfolding this year that is very complicated, a little hard to explain, and frankly not that exciting. In other words, perfect for public television. <laughs> it involves pharmacy benefit managers. These companies are the middlemen in the prescription drug supply chain. In theory, these PBMs, as they're called, negotiate with drug companies to get good prices for big health insurance plans, including Medicaid. But as the Columbus Dispatch has uncovered over the past several months, the middlemen may be actually driving up costs, overcharging Medicaid, and under-reimbursing pharmacies. Kathy Kandiski, you've been a lead reporter on this. The state is taking action, it appears, the state, finally. The state just recently announced that they're going to drop the contracts they have with their PBMs that have been, char that have been engaged in spread pricing, and that's basically where they're charging the insurer, in this case Medicaid, far more than they're reimbursing the individual pharmacist for filling the prescription. So they're going to try and get rid of that and they're going to go to a system that's called a pass-through model that they say will be more transparent and where they'll pay a set fee to the PBM to administer the claim and the PBM will no longer be able to set the rates on both ends to build this you know, large profit for themselves. The PBMs, was that simple enough for you? It was perfect. The PBMs <laughs> claim they just, they just try to make a buck here. They take a little bit for their administrative costs and make a profit. But they're making, in fact, $223 million as a spread between what they were getting paid and what they were paying the actual uh, uh, pharmacy. Uh, as an example, I think that everybody accepted that they could charge like a dollar thirty-nine or something like that per prescription, but they were charging in excess of five dollars per. Three to six times more than the norm, more than the norm. The consultant that did the That's state right. study. And this affects not just Medicaid, but private insurance as well. This, this, this affects taxpayers. This affects everybody. Everybody that has health insurance is paying for this. Everybody that pays taxes is paying for it because that's how the Medicaid program and programs like Medicare and other you know, publicly funded programs are funded. How much profit should a middleman make, Jim, would you say? I mean, is there, let's, should the government get involved in that? Or? Let's apply the model we've always used, we used to use for the pu publicly uh, uh, privately invest, private invested uti utilities um, that uh, it was between, oh, somewhere between 8 and a very high of 15 percent. Uh, so I think 8 percent would have been, 8 to 10 percent would have been a normal pass-through. Mm -hmm. And that's, you look, look at an example there, a regulatory entity, this is what we used to do. Yeah. And, and some of these were real pass-through, pass-through, where in fact mm -hmm. there was nothing done by the right. intermediary. Right. Now, the concern is that this is not over because there's other ways PBMs make money. They make money through manufacturers' rebates. They make money by charging fees to the pharmacies. So there's all kinds of ways these PBMs make money. And the fear is if they, if they come down on the spread pricing, they're just going to see them move to a different method of making money. So we'll have I to see. I think what this really goes to is the fact that the entire medical structure in America, because of what happened during World War II, wage freezes, we instead gave out benefits for health care, we've approached this house of cards in a way unique from any other country, which is why we have statistically mediocre coverage and highest cost. And it goes to a whole slew of things. For example, in the 1930s, the, um, o the Ohio Medical, the U.S. Medical Association, the doctors convinced the Congress to close two thirds of all medical schools slots. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, you can't underestimate how big this is because you know there's three and a half million, three point one million, three point two billion million people on Medicaid. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. And yes. then you know everybody's. T most mm -hmm. people are taking mm -hmm. one or more prescription drugs. Medicaid mm -hmm. spends about over three billion a year on prescription drugs. Right. Mm -hmm. it's a so lot. it's, it's a, what I like to call a DBI, a dull but important story. <laughs> I'm Again, glad, I'm glad to be yes. working on a dull but important story. Dull but important. <laughs> Public TV says bring them on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get to our next topic. Uh, far from dull and 
boring. The OSU and Buckeye fans, if they thought the Urban Meyer controversy would fade after last week's suspension and mm -hmm. news conference, they were wrong. It continues to be the talk of college football and the talk of the town here in central Ohio this week's developments. The dispatch got a hold of the report the Powell police tried to keep secret. It details numerous allegations of domestic abuse made by the ex-wife of fire coach Zach Smith. Zach Smith lashed out at the media, the university, and others in a Twitter tirade. And we learned a member of the OSU Board of Trustees quit over the controversy. Former board chairman Jeffrey Wadsworth resigned, saying Meyer's three-game suspension was not enough. Gene Krebs, you live outside this bubble, this OSU bubble, this Columbus bubble. Mm -hmm. What do the folks in Western Ohio think of all this in the, in the farmland? Uh, they're baffled. And I think what you're seeing is that, um, let me put it this way. The, the Kasich administration has done a remarkable job on many topics. There's two in which they failed at. One, they've not yet dealt with the changing utility landscape, and they have completely failed to rein in OSU. And if you talk to any of the folks out there who actually understand how things are supposed to work here, OSU is out of control, has been out of control. And I guess this is the last time the Glenn School will invite me to come in for a guest speak. <laughs> is, that, is that a perception at the State House? Or because we, we're in this bubble, OSU well, there is. There is a perception, I think, that Gene's talking about that it's sports above all else with Ohio State sometimes. I think that's the perception. But when you're inside the bubble, the perception is, why are you picking on Ohio State? And there's a lot of people locally here that are really defensive of Urban Meyer and Ohio State on this matter. You know, I think one of the problems that, that they've had is that um, they've, in the last decade or so, they've really tried to move away from uh, being a football you know, football factory and that that's the only focus. And they've they've really emphasized a lot of their other premier programs and have um, raised the level of academics, et cetera. And I think that this Urban Meyer situation really presented um, uh, a delicate balance for them of, of uh, trying to figure out, you know, how are they going to reflect the values of the university but also um, win football games. And the story is uh, everywhere else in the United States as well. A friend of mine here from Columbus is traveling through Boston, and he calls me and he says, what's going on in Columbus? He says that the Urban Meyer thing is all over the news. This, mm -hmm. was, this was on Thursday. And so I think this has legs, and so long as the national media continues on it, we can see repercussions. I'm not saying necessarily that anybody's gonna, anybody else is going to get fired, but this is not going to go away. If you go back to the tape about five years ago, I called for Ohio State to get rid of Gene Smith. Why? Because Ohio State's out of control. And it's not just the athletic department. It's a whole panoply of issues at Ohio State. Do students in, the, in western and rural areas still want to come here, though, to Ohio State? They can't get in here. Is that part of the problem? The academic mm -hmm. are so high that folks are feeling No, but about? it's going to have long term and it's going to have an impact on Columbus because uh, as long as Ohio State had the attitude, you could, if you could drag your carcass here and pay the fees, we would take you. Um, Columbus became the home of all the second sons and sisters of Lima so to speak, so that you know they couldn't take over dad's and mom's business. They come here to get a degree, and after you see the short North the Arena District, you're not going to go back home, but you're going to add now your entrepreneurship here. Yeah. Now Ohio State graduates, they go to Chicago, San Francisco, New York. They don't stay here. A lot of those kids who came dropped out, and that's why they raised the standards, according to OSU anyway. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey Wadsworth, member of the board, was the former chairman. Former chairman. He was the chairman when they hired Michael Drake. You quit. You never see dissension. Within an hour. On the uh, OSU Board of yeah, Trustees. Fair to say he walked out. Yeah. I mean, he quit. Yeah, he bailed after lunch. Yeah, he bailed on the meeting and he gave the resignation letter an hour after the mm -hmm. decision was made. Mm -hmm. but he's, the university says that 19 other members agreed with the decision. Is he a lone wolf or a sign of dissension on the board, do you think? But what I studied yeah, I, in college was groupthink and what you saw in the trustees, and you see this all the time on boards and commissions, groupthink. You saw no, groupthink. No, I had heard no. that the board felt that they had overreacted with Trestle years ago, and this was sort of an overcorrection. I think that the trustees in general are very loyal to the university and to the brand, and they do not air their dirty laundry. So I thought it was pretty exceptional that Wadsworth uh, quit and then told the New York Times that he had quit. But he, but he, he told the New York Times, but I, he didn't go into a lot of detail. I didn't right. think. I don't, I don't think he went into a lot. Of, he didn't spill it 
to the New York Times. Yeah, it was odd. He said that the penalty was, was not profound mm. enough, insufficiently mm. profound, which is a... That's right. I thought he presented his opinion, but I didn't think he went out of his way to sl slam the university. But I also think that, you know, they had a 12-hour meeting. If, if they were all on the same page, it wouldn't have taken 12 hours. Well, the other thing is the real ramification is going to be from some group called the NCAA is going to come through, and that's where the real ramification is going to come. And also, the, the, the federal investigation into the, to the Strauss investigation, the doctor who is now deceased, was accused of assaulting, sexually assaulting. Not a good story either. Scores right. of, of well, athletes. now they're up to 150 firsthand yeah. accounts from former students. Yeah. Wow. Okay, the Columbus City Council will have a controversial proposal to deal with when it returns from summer break in a couple of weeks. It's the proposed ticket tax. The plan is to put a 7% tax on most entertainment tickets purchased in Columbus, Blue Jackets games, the symphony, other concerts, even movie tickets. OSU tickets are exempt. The money generated by the tax would go to support arts organizations around town, and about a third would go to maintain Nationwide Arena now owned by us, the local taxpayers. Supporters say it's a fair way to support the arts and arena repairs. Opponents disagree. They fear the tax will drive away performances. Joe Mass, is this a good tax? Folks who use the arts pay for the arts. I'm well, a Democrat. Like, I mean, you know. So you haven't seen a tax I haven't seen a tax like? I haven't liked. <laughs> no, actually, we're, they're talking about a 7% tax. It's supposed to raise between 14 and $20 million. Some of that, I think about 30%, is actually supposed to go to the Nationwide Arena, and then the rest to a variety of art uh, projects. And the Arts Council has done a good job over the years in spreading this kind of thing around. But one of the, the biggest issues is... Should this be everybody, at, at the, all the functions, or should there be maybe some nonprofits that would be exempted from some of the functions that they would, would sponsor? That hasn't been determined, even though they've had three meetings on this. Because most of the arts organizations, many of them are nonprofits, so right. they're exempted and That's they get right. the money without having to charge their viewer, right. listeners, or audience. But here's the key theory in public policy and tax is that you need a logical nexus of activity so that when you are taxed there is a benefit back to the person that's taxed either directly or indirectly. And in this case uh, if you're t you know some of the folks who are being taxed will never get any benefit from that. So if they want it, they need to exempt all of the small why not just simply tax the the big boys in this and let all the small fish go away. Or if you're going to tax the small fish, give them a seat at the table with a council that determines, makes recommendations to the city council on how the tax is to be spent and have it, but have it weighted for on proportionately, not that the arena, that the arena district gets 30 votes, and everybody else gets two. Yeah. Well, when one gets taxed, one doesn't necessarily see a direct benefit from the percentage of those t of the taxes that that maybe should be going to you because you're not in need necessarily. So I, I don't have a problem with, with them not receiving a direct benefit because a greater community receives it, a benefit. It's too tenuous. On, look, on all public policy, on all tax, if I want to sell a tax to anybody, I need to have a logical nexus for it. Is there this, is no nexus. This is $3.50 on a $50 ticket. Yeah. When you buy a ticket to a concert in this town, you're paying, what, $10 to Ticketmaster or things like that? I mean, yeah, is, you got is it. this a big deal? I don't, well, I don't, I don't know. I think it's pretty irritating that when you do buy a ticket that yeah. there's, there's already yeah. other fees that are tacked on, and it's difficult yeah. to get around those. Um, but at the same time, y you know, you're, it's your entertainment dollars, so maybe yeah. it's... Mm. It's, maybe maybe you don't have a hot dog. It's like when I fly. I'm tired of paying for extra handkerchiefs I take with me, you know, <laughs> luggage, whatever. You know. But unlike yeah. a bed tax that is often used for these types of things that people from out of town pay, yeah. this is something that people in town are going to pay. So I think it you know raises the level of debate on and, it. And the bed tax is usually used for the tourism and visitors bureau, which right. tends to spread it out evenly throughout more of the whole community. That's missing from this, as I understand it. I guess the bottom line is, should hockey fans be paying for Opera Columbus? Not that hockey fans can't love opera. And should Opera Columbus be paying for repairs to the Nationwide Arena? Well, somebody's got to pay so. for repairs to Nationwide Arena. Yeah, but not really? the Blue Jackets. They don't pay any rent. <laughs> <laughs> and they get to keep the beer money. <laughs> That's the other thing. Should the, the Blue Jackets, should they? Should they be paying rent? Yeah, should they be paying rent? And, right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now you get to your nexus issue. Of course they should. Yeah. <laughs>
How's this, where does this end up, Joe? Do you think it gets the last time? There's been two tax oh, no, votes. I think it, I think it's going to go through. You yeah. think it will go you think through. I do. Through yeah. at the same rate, or do you it, think it, there might be a compromise? I was thinking oh. there may be a compromise where they lower the rate of the tax to make somebody happy, and that's always possible. But I, I actually don't think the seven percent is that the, high. The, no. the purpose of politics is to make the consultants rich. I'm afraid some days. And so if this does pass city council, it will be we go petition to get referendum, get put on the ballot, and then you're going to see at least four consultants who I'm very good friends with should take me out to lunch. Well, I did hear, interesting enough, that Mike Coleman and John Kennedy, former council member, are the lobbyists for the Arts Commission. Mm -hmm. So I think that bodes well for their chances. The, Michael Coleman got an income tax increase through the voters. But oh, the, yeah. remember the car rental tax that the city council, in, that was on out-of-towners, mm -hmm. the right. car rental tax, and the right. voters shot that down. That was a long time ago. Yeah. It mixed results on votes on taxes. Don't tax me, don't tax thee. Let's tax the fellow behind the tree. There you go, or behind the arena. <laughs> Besides the OSU football mess, the biggest news in Columbus this summer is the scooter invasion. Those motorized lime and bird scooters showed up seemingly overnight, and they are everywhere. Riders are using them to get to downtown meetings. OSU students are using them to get to class and wherever else. They are easy to ride. They are activated by a smartphone and it's fairly cheap, but they can clutter sidewalks and annoy pedestrians now on those sidewalks. So the city this week put down some rules. The city will limit the field to eight scooter companies. Each company can only operate 500 scooters. The firms would pay a $500 upfront fee and then $75 per scooter. The scooter must, scooters must be available in low-income areas and allow payment methods other than credit cards. Joe Moss, you rode a scooter today. I, I did today. So is this... Just, do you like these? Are they, do you ever wear, move them to downtown meetings, use them to go to downtown meetings at all? Well, I was going to do that last week, as a matter of fact, to see a client at uh, Nationwide Children's. However, that went away, so I didn't get a chance to try it. So in preparation for this today, I thought I would try one. And in addition to how easy they are to, to operate and, and all of that, I was actually impressed by how fast they went. Did and maybe a little concerned. I was on it. And I was a little concerned. I had no helmet. No. Oh. Sorry. But uh, in any event, I was, I was uh, concerned that it was pretty fast. And I'm thinking, geez, what if somebody comes around a corner, a pedestrian, and I'm on the sidewalk? Because there is nothing to prevent you right now from writing these things on the sidewalk. And uh, that's what it was just going to get in, uh, interesting and, and, and exciting. Now, the companies say you should ride these on the street. You should not ride these on the sidewalk. It's an yeah. app. Well, people are riding them on the sidewalk. They I mean, are. You know, my fear is no when people come across the crosswalk and the sidewalk really fast like that. Yeah. When you're driving, you don't they're necessarily, gonna they're going to get clipped. Yeah. And coming out of a building. Uh, Zach Klein, the city attorney, put out a statement that uh, the, the law is unclear, that therefore they could be ridden on sidewalks or the streets yeah. until it's determined which is, you know, what the intent was. But honestly, you're not supposed to ride your bicycle on sidewalks. I don't know how mm -hmm. scooters are allowed because they, they do, do go yeah. fast. They do downtown. Right. My word today, obviously, is the word nexus because when I'm looking at the fees and everything for this project from the city, I'm going, there's no logical nexus. It's like, kind of like they kind of went and said, let's throw up some numbers up on the whiteboard and see which ones stick. I mean, there's no logic to what they decide here. Eight companies, why, why eight? Why not six? Why not 10? And then if you create, now you're creating an artificial constraint on the market. So now you're going to have those existing ones can sell their, their license for this. Then. What, what I didn't well, I think understand. you have to start somewhere. I'm sorry, Lori. I think you have to start somewhere and then you can adjust. Nobody said this is the final say so on it. This is a kind of a new frontier and, you know, yeah. Traffic and what, what I thought was interesting is that instead of dealing with what everybody's talking about, which is why are they on the sidewalks and why are they going so fast, they dealt with all these other issues about distribution, right. how many companies, and I think I think where that they're supposed to be. What I was told is that the, those things require the you know the mm -hmm. banning them from the sidewalks that would require a city ordinance, which. I would guess the city's going to. This conversation look into. is being had all over the United States. It's amazing mm -hmm. how many cities have hundreds if not thousands of we, these things. We, we were at a wedding in Austin last month, which is a very cool, very hot city, but there were 10 times the number of these little scooter things out there on the streets. And I was going, oh my gosh, I was waiting to see blood and mayhem on the street at any point in time. Surprisingly, nobody got That's killed. That's the thing. There hasn't, there've been some isolated accidents so far. Mm -hmm. There've been a couple. I mean, there's always gonna be a couple, but it's been, they're popular. 
It's gonna be hard to take. It's gonna be hard to take them off the streets. We got to get to our off the record comments. Maybe you can predict they'll be gone. I don't know. It is time for our off the record comments. Parting shots from our panel. Joe Moss, you're up first. I do, and it brings me no joy to say this, but I will predict that the text message setting on Urban Meyer's cell phone will continue to be a story, and I also predict that the university is going to want to see it back for forensic examination. Gene. Uh, for those of you who follow me on Twitter, I recently tweeted about the Ohio Manufacturers Association has come out with their new candidate guide. It talks about the index. It is an association with Hannah New Service. If you read this, you'll never have to talk to me ever again. <laughs> <laughs> that would be no fun. Kathy. Uh, the Department of Education came out this week with their new education plan, and interestingly enough, it shifts away from testing, which has been the mantra for so long. And now it's going to require some legislation to kind of help move in that direction, but I think that's what the next thing you're going to see in state education policy is a move away from testing. And Laura? The city of Dayton decided to put on the November ballot a, a measure to decriminalize possession of marijuana of mm -hmm. less than 100 grams. Um, I think that it's going to drive an enormous amount of voter turnout, and I think that uh, the Republican lawmakers are not going to be happy with it. Is it constitutional? We TDD. shall see. Yeah. Ohio State opens its football season. Believe it or not, there will be football play this weekend, and I predict that OSU will win because they're playing Oregon State University. So one way or another, OSU will be victorious this weekend at the Shoe, and that's one prediction of mine you can take to the bank. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online, Facebook, and Twitter. Also, you can see each episode on demand at our website, wosu.org slash COTR. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.